Our next witnesses are 422 and 427, the two sisters that will testify together on this issue. It's found on page 69 of your bundle, which, which is in the reserve, the addendum. Um, is the translator on? Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, the chair is going to swear you in before we begin. Thank you, uh, Madam Witnesses, for agreeing to testify. Would you both repeat after me, but uh, please, um, one after the other, so we can hear both of you uh, uh, de declare. Starting first with 422, uh, would you repeat after me? I do solemnly declare that I will speak the truth. I solemnly declare to speak the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. 427 next, please. I do solemnly declare that I will speak the truth. I solemnly declare to speak the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. It's now from the prosecution and that will likely be followed by questions from the panel. Thank you. Good morning. Can you please tell us uh, what brings you here today and what you saw or witnessed on in Aban during the month of the Aban protests? And I've been made aware that there is a video, so when you're ready, we will show that as well. But please proceed. Good morning to you too. What has uh, led us to attend this meeting is a testimony that we wanted to present about the catastrophe and the killings that took place two years ago in the Arban month um, against my people. That's why we have come here. According to the film and the incidents that we witnessed and the documents that we have brought here, we wanted to testify against the killings that took place in Iran at that time. Two years ago in Aban 98, what we realized through cyberspace was that there were some protests uh, on 16th of November, 25th of Aban. Two days before, of course, the news on the price hike, fuel price hike. Uh, uh, was issued, and uh, in the cyber state, uh, cyberspace, it was mentioned that there would be protests on 16th of November, 25th of Aban. Because of the economic pressures people had suffered in the previous years, and we realized that a large number of these pressures are due to the incompetency of the Islamic State, uh, and people could uh, feel all that those pressures, so they decided to come out in a peaceful protest. And that was what was advertised in the cyberspace. I remember that my sister called me that day and said that it was about 10, 10.30 in the morning. And in Sanandaj, where we lived, uh, they said that uh, that city was uh, quite uh, crowded. And I asked whether there were clashes. And she said, no, only people had come out, uh, turned out in the streets. Uh, with, uh, they had come with their cars, and they had turned off their cars. And in Shishon Bahman Street in San Andaj, they had blocked the road. And uh, she told me, if you come here, be careful with your car. Before getting to the um, Adab uh, um, area, I just remember that I just left my car in the middle of the street because there was no place to park it. I just got off the car, joined my sister. I was waiting a little bit further away. And it was about an hour that we waited there. The people were just out there in a peaceful way. They 
um, without any clashes. They were just waiting there. They were just looking. They wanted to see. We saw that nothing was happening. Then we came a bit further away, uh, close to the Azad University of uh, Sarandaj. And you can see in the film, we saw that the students of the university had uh, raised tents close to the university. And the, close to the gate of the university, uh, they had blocked the way, and the university was closed down. There were younger students there, so we joined them. They needed more help. So we just went there and sat along with the, with the students in protest against the increase in the fuel prices. It was about 20 to 25 minutes that we sat there, and we just realized that nothing was going on. And we just, I just thought that maybe they were... Um, they were going to come and apologize to people, and maybe they are doing something as they were not doing anything. And then later we realized through the same cyberspace that they were killing people in other places, and that's why they didn't have time to get to the Adab, uh, Adab area. When we came a bit, when we went a bit further at about 11, 11.30, we just realized that the cars were just moving, and uh, the 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 the. the the windscreen of many of the cars were broken. Uh, we wanted to see what was happening. We realized that the windscreens of, uh, of these cars were broken. The police were coming towards the Adab uh, area, and the situation was quite dire and dangerous. We saw that there were some motorcycle riders with black uh, uh, coverings and black cover, uh, um, clothes and also helmets. Uh, they just uh, got off the uh, motorcycles, and uh, with the movement that they had in the pavements, they used to beat people with baton so that they would scatter people, disperse people. We were uh, standing uh, here and there, and since we were not able to move the cars and there were a lot of people around, so they started uh, beating people. So the beating started. They used to go back and forth, causing fear. There, nothing was happening in ten, for 10, 20 minutes, and afterwards the same repeated. After half an hour, uh, we were waiting uh, where we were uh, standing was... Uh, the governor's office of Sarandaj, it was the Adab uh, um, junction. And since I remember there was no COVID then, there was no masks used by people. About 100 individuals, plainclothes offices had masks. They came towards us and we thought that maybe they are uh, from among people. There are, pop, there are ordinary people who have put masks on so that they would not be identified. Suddenly we realized that all of them put their hands in their pockets and took out big pieces of stones and bricks, and then they started throwing them at the people. We realized that they were plainclothes officers from the security forces. Even one of these stones uh, hit the head of a 40 to 45-year-old woman, and she just fell down. Her son... Uh, was shouting and crying um, at uh, uh, next to his mother's body, and since we were all frightened, we just uh, moved towards an alley on the side of the Adab intersection, and uh, we knew that they had uh, been using gas, uh, tear gas, and um, uh, I hadn't had an experience, so when I went to that alley, I just uh, got unconscious because of the tear gas. I couldn't breathe for a few minutes. I didn't know that it was tear gas. I just thought that maybe uh, there is a poison or something, and I'm going to die, and that's why I had fallen on the ground. But when I listened to what other people were saying, I just realized that this was just the tear gas, and they were shouting. There were some uh, tissues. Um, which uh, had vinegar on, and they were putting it, putting it in front of my nose, and they also were um, blowing um, um, cigarette smoke into my face so that I would uh, become conscious. I just uh, got better. I saw my sister was shouting and crying, and she, her eyes was quite red. She didn't feel good either. But since physically I was a bit weaker than her, I had completely become unconscious. But she hadn't. Afterwards, I wanted to leave. I had seen. I saw that the cars had been scattered, dispersed. I had lost the car key. I looked for my car key for a long time. Then I went back to the street. I hadn't done anything to be frightened from the forces that were beating the people and the plainclothes officers. But I saw with my own eyes that they were beating people. They had 
taken their masks off so that they wouldn't be recognized among the people. They were beating people 15, 16, 17, 20 years old. And they were beating people so hard. I, a few times, uh, in fact, uh, begged them not to beat people. I even throw myself on their foot so that they won't beat people. I begged them so hard not to beat the pe people that I was able to save one or two people. They listened to me. But the th there was a third person who came, and I realized that my sister was doing the same, uh, begging the uh, plainclothes officers not to beat other people. Then I realized that my sister was being beaten up by baton and also by uh, a hose, and her hair were being pulled, and she had fallen on the ground. I tried to help her, uh, and you can see the pictures. They beat me on my hand, and my hand uh, swelled, uh, uh, became swollen, and we didn't have any uh, life security there. I just saw that uh, the people were being taken by uh, uh, young people, and they were thrown into the governor's office, and then they closed the doors of the governor's office afterwards. We came, went back to the street, to the alley again. There was a gentleman who called himself a doctor. I don't remember exactly who he was. Uh, he put a um, piece of stick. He tied a piece of stick uh, uh, along uh, my hand, and he said that my uh, hand had, was broken, and I had to go to the hospital, but I never went to the hospital, and uh, my arm, my hand hurt for about a month or once and a half. That was the first day. If you have any questions, I can answer. Then on the second day, I was on the streets again. If you have any questions about the first day, I'll be happy to answer. I can move really quickly to witness 427. Can, can you describe what happened to you? I see in your statement there is, um, you have stated that you were shot? Yes. What my sister said about the first date was uh, I, I actually I, I witnessed the same, and I also heard the sound of fire, and uh, we saw IRGC officers, and I have pictures of that. They were wearing brown and uh, maybe khaki uh, um, clothes, which is uh, belongs to the IRGC. And also, on the second day, they arrested our nephew. He uh, he was he's a 15 year old boy. He'd left home in the morning. My mother phoned and said, "Your nephew is missing. Go and find out where he is." And we kept calling his phone, and there was no answer. And I guessed that he must have been arrested. It was about 3 or maybe 5 p.m. And uh, we, try we went to see where the nephew is, because we'd heard that he was kept in 12 Farvardin Street by the intelligence unit uh, forces and, um, and by the, sorry, police uh, in uh, there, and it was a big square, and we saw there was a massive crowd, and uh, the, many of the shops ha had uh, half closed, and there is also an, um, a bridge for uh, people, pedestrians, to pass through, and I can't tell you exactly, but there were about 15 officers, anti-riot uh, uh, police, and they were shooting at people from the top of the bridge, and they were throwing tear gas um, in all the towards all the alleys. This is a very big square, and uh, there leads to different alleys. And it's uh, one of the older parts of Sanandaj, and the alleys are very uh, narrow, and this, these alleys were filled with tear gas. And um, the people had uh, set up a fire in order to uh, try and uh, quell this uh, tear gas effect. And uh, uh, so the roads were all closed. We couldn't pass through. After some half an hour, the officers left after about half an hour, and somebody shouted, said, try and flee because motorcyclists are coming. And I can tell you, I saw about a hundred motorcyclists, and it was getting 
dark, and I was uh, standing at the top of a road, and I managed to flee. But unfortunately, uh, I was hit by tear gas right in front of my foot. There was a tear gas, and uh, and this tear gas was moving, and I was hit by that. And I heard a sound of firing, and I screamed. And I was in such a bad state, and I was I felt I was suffocating. And I just noticed two people were holding my hand and taking me inside their home to help me. And they uh, burnt some uh, pieces of paper for me they, uh, to get uh, rid of the tear gas effect. And I wasn't in a bad, I was in a really bad state and I eventually made it home. And, uh, and I noticed my foot was bleeding. And I was really surprised because I hadn't felt the rubber bullets then because I was in a bad state because of a tear gas. I wasn't. I didn't even know what a rubber bullet was. It was my brothers who told me this is a rubber bullet and you were hit by a rubber bullet in your foot. And after some two hours, I, we returned to 12 Farvardin to the police uh, intelligence center to find out what's happened to my nephew. And one said, go to prison. The other one said, go to the court. One said, you have to go to the intelligence. And I said, it's impossible for an 18 child under the age of 18 to be sent to prison. Although I am not a lawyer, but I'm not so illiterate not to know that you cannot send a child under the age of 18 to prison and they said to me oh no your nephew will be returned and I'd also taken a mother with us and a man said to him he's uh, my nephew's name that we will make sure he return it was about one in the morning that my nephew returned and my mother said he's home and it seems uh, they had uh, let them go in in a it's a desert kind area to Shazar that we called them. They had asked got them to give them a pledge. They'd given them a piece of paper and told them to sign. And I said, What was on that paper? He said there was nothing on that piece of paper, but they just asked her to sign. And um and I apologize. And I apologize but he they, he was told to make a sound like a donkey. And uh, they they were told to behave to make sounds of a donkey. Um, they called one of them to make a sound of a dog, the other one a donkey, and then they asked them to sign this blank piece of paper, which they did. We have questions for you, but can the technical team play the video, please? <laughs> Tear gas in my eyes. Mr. Chair. I don't think there's any questions uh, from the panel, uh, but we thank you very much for attending. And um, prosecuting counsel, do you have anything further? No, no okay. further questions. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please do. Thank you very much, um, both of you. We really appreciate it, and we'll take everything you've said into account. Thank you. We also like to thank you.